We're looking at uh, one more psalm um, this morning. It's Psalm 91. And uh, this psalm uh, speaks about and uses some terminology with regards to refuges and fortresses. Um, and our title is The Refuge of God's Presence. Uh, now we have, uh, of late, I think, uh, you know, there's certainly been and always is an emphasis on the fact that without God's presence, we really don't have anything other than a club or a group, uh, an organization. Um, and, you know, as we see things unfolding the way the scripture says they're going to, we recognize that certain things are coming, right? Certain things are coming. Even in our natural life, in your life and in mine, um, you know that there are some inevitable things that are going to take place. Um, and one of them, of course, being death um, of this natural body at some point in time. Um, and as we look to the future, and as you think, and I was thinking about a refuge, um, it's a good thing to plan for that. It's a good thing to, at the very least, be ready in some way, shape, or form. You know, we don't live in an area that's particularly prone to tornadoes. I'll use that as an example, although we recently had one strike in air, which is not too far away. But if we were in an area that had more of that, or uh, we were, you know, in an area where there are hurricanes on a regular basis, um, we would prepare, if we were wise, ahead of time, a place where we could shelter, a place where we could find safety. Um, and that's really what a refuge is. A refuge is a, a place, generally speaking, um, where we can find shelter in that time of storm. Um, a number of years back now, Stephanie and I, on one of our motorcycle journeys, uh, ran into a great deal of rain down in the Appalachians. Um, we were, I think, I was going to say, well, foolish <laughs> in our, our desire to, to tent and to camp. Um, and, uh, but, you know, uh, as we were uh, driving in torrential rain and things like that, you know, people were seeking refuge underneath the overhangs of bridges and, and different things of that nature. We eventually found refuge at a church, which was interesting enough, um, as it had sort of an overhang like we have here. Um, and we pulled in there, and just as we were sort of getting off of the motorcycle, and drenched and cold and weary, not an ideal travel situation, uh, some people who um, were cleaning the church happened to come by and let us go in and use the facilities and, and sort of get ourselves back in order a little bit. It, it, was, a, it was a refuge for us, and something that uh, separates us then from uh, whatever is troubling us. Um, and, and so when we speak about the Lord being our refuge, now we're talking about not necessarily a physical place, um, and most importantly, not necessarily refuge from a physical trial or test. But we have to remember the spiritual battles that take place. And they can be greater and more devastating than anything that uh, naturally could occur to us. And in that time, as the psalmist here in Psalm 91 speaks, um, we have a place, or we can have a place, as God's people, where we can find shelter, where we can find uh, a peace in that time of storm, a place that is separate from what is going on around us, um, and that place is with the Lord. So in his presence, we find that peace. We're going to sing that chorus this morning. Um, because it is God's presence that is the shelter. It is God's presence that becomes the refuge. I want to differentiate just a little bit from the fact that we also see in this particular psalm the term fortress. And, you know, as I was thinking about the two, I thought, well, you know, what's the difference? You know, because when you look up the definition, they're very, very much the same. Uh, you know, a refuge, um, and they will say that a fortress can be a refuge. 
uh, again, a place of shelter and a place of protection. The one thing that, that sort of struck me is that um, a refuge can be a hidden sort of place, whereas a fortress tends to be something that's fairly obvious, in my mind at least. And, and for me, that's an interesting difference because it means that though the enemy knows where we might be sheltering, they still can't get to us. You know, uh, as a child, you might, or I'm thinking now about thunderstorms and things like that. Some children will hide under a blanket. Some children, or perhaps even adults, or I know dogs, uh, that will, will, you know, scurry underneath furniture and will get underneath the bed or whatever it happens to be, seeking refuge, seeking a place where they will be safe. Um, I could say an umbrella is a form of refuge from the rain, and yet those things don't strike in me the same image as a fortress. Somehow a fortress is much larger and it's much more robust, um, and so um, we have this also this image here in the psalm that even when the enemy knows exactly where you are and where I am, if we are seeking refuge in the fortress, which is Christ our Lord, which is God, then he still can't strike us. Uh, because in the face of God's power and, and God's shelter, the enemy is helpless. And that's something for us to not only celebrate, uh, but to make sure that we are aware of. <coughs> And that we're prepared for that. And so what I mean by that, and if you go with me now to Psalm 91, um, the first verse says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So the first particular verse right away puts a great deal of emphasis on God's presence. And this idea that we need to be and dwell and abide where the Lord is. Okay. When you go on a holiday, you generally find, a, you know, you've got a room somewhere or you might have multiple places where you stay short term. Right? It's not your home. It's not a place that you particularly put your mark upon. I mean, you know, when we go someplace and you unpack things and you might put things into the drawers that are there and you put things on the bathroom shelves and, and that, but it's not permanent. It's just something that you're there and then you leave again and, you know, most of us would leave it sort of the way we found it. Um, and that's not a dwelling. That's not dwelling in a place. That's not abiding in a place. And so, right away, the psalmist is strongly saying, through God's Spirit, that as God's people, this is not a come-and-go sort of relationship. Okay? You can't expect, uh, even though many people will, you know, that the Lord will bless me, the Lord will protect me, He will take care of me, all of these things, but I'm going to sort of just jump in and out of His presence. And, and unfortunately, these people will say, well, most of the time I'm doing my own thing, but I'm really, when I'm really in a bind, that's when, you know, I'll, I'll run back to the fortress, I'll run back. And that sort of just reminds me of the foolish virgins a little bit who when they came, the door was closed. And then some people again would quickly say, oh, well, I thought God is love. How could he leave those foolish virgins out there? Well, there are requirements. There is a process. And so when the psalmist says, when the Lord says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, when the psalmist says that, the emphasis here is not on whether or not God can protect us. It's on whether or not you and I are dwelling where the Lord is. We can't blame God for our error. We can't blame the Lord and point fingers at Him for our failures. He has it all set up. It's all there. But we have to dwell. 
We have to abide. And this image that is created here of the under the shadow of the Almighty, if you consider for a moment how a shadow comes to be, right? The uh, point is that there's something then, if we're in the shadow, there's something between us and whatever is creating the shadow. And so you have again this picture, which is continued in the psalm, of God standing between us and the enemy, us and the trial, us and the turmoil. And that's what a fortress does, right? And that's what a refuge does. It's something where we get into, under, whatever, this place that separates us from what is causing us grief, what is causing us trouble. And so physically, it's, you know, we're, we can very quickly do that. We often do that kind of thing. But again, I have to draw your attention to how important it is to be able to do this spiritually. See, this is where... When we are in God's presence, we can have an, a peace that the world, the Bible says, they don't understand it. But the critical piece is they can't take it away. Because it's not based on a natural thing. Okay? It's not peace based on how many weapons I have. It's not peace based on how strong I am physically. It's not peace based on how big my bank account is. It's not peace based on any of those natural things. It's a peace that exists inside. In our heart, in our mind. Because the Lord is there. And He creates this barrier, right? Uh, the, the Bible speaks about the Holy Spirit sealing us, okay, blanketing us in a sense. And as we read here, also, this is the psalm that speaks about the angels of the Lord, right? In a sense, encamping around about us, sheltering us from these things that would so easily beset us. And so, the emphasis on what you are doing and what I am doing all of the time because the storms and the trials and the tests, they can come anytime. And generally speaking, they often come when we least expect them. Right? I was thinking about the yacht that sank off of Sicily, right? You know, and then there, you know, there are people's lives who were lost, and, and uh, you know, whether the, you know, agree or disagree with the people's how they were living their lives, the point is striking you know, like you would think what are the odds? What, what's the chance? You know there's this big yacht, you know it's a, you know, a couple hundred meters or whatever off of the shore not necessarily that far okay, off of shore it's anchored, it's calm weather everything seems fine and in, in an instant Something strikes just that particular spot, right? So that you know some of the people couldn't get out. The ship sinks, you know, quickly, 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 and they're trying to figure out why. And you know, human error, they're saying, and all of these things, which can play a role in that, certainly. But again, you see, when when I'm just using that as an example, when trouble hits, generally speaking, you don't have a lot of time to prepare at that point. You need to be prepared before. Those people needed to be right with the Lord before that storm hit. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, God knows, maybe they had opportunity. Okay. But the, the possibility, you know, and again, so then I would ask myself the question, why play with those odds? Why would I want to take that risk? when we have so much opportunity to get ready and to actually make sure we're dwelling, as it says, with the Lord. Verse 2, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him will I trust. And we see this idea of trust uh, very, very much is dominant in this psalm because if you're going to go someplace or rush into something that you think is a shelter, you better trust in it. 
Because there's really no point in jumping into a place where you're not sure whether it's going to do it or not. It's not the, that's not the peace and the rest that God's people can have. The world, I would say, they do that all the time. They're jumping from one possible shelter to another possible shelter, to another possible peace treaty, to another this, to another that, to another something else. But at the same time that they're entering into those agreements, they're already filled with doubt and question okay, as to whether it's going to last. Well, what we know from the Lord is He always lasts and His shelter is going to withstand anything and so again this peace in Him will I trust it's not on God's like God isn't the one who needs to trust in us in this particular sort of situation we're the ones again that have to have the trust we're the ones that have to have the faith that the Lord is able to do what he says. And then, you know, the next word in the third verse is linked to that trust. Surely he will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Right? So this is the kind of attitude that the psalmist and what the Bible is saying, as God's people, I need to have, you need to have. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that that can't be a battle. Because we know that that is the area in which the devil, he wants to weaken us. Right? He wants you to doubt. He wants me to doubt. He wants me to question. He wants me to fear. He wants me to say, can God really heal me of this? Can the Lord really deliver me from this? Is it true? Will he do it? I'm sort of in touch with somebody right now who is, in, for all intents and purposes, to my best knowledge, a Christian, but is dealing with an oppressive spirit, I'm going to say, that is throwing nothing but doubt into this person's mind. Right? Have I confessed enough? Have, is this sin really under the blood? Um, am I living a holy enough life? Right? These, all of these questions, 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 which ultimately are eroding their trust and faith in the Lord, and that's exactly what the enemy wants. Okay? Because in a moment of trial, in a moment of test, and we'll go back, let's say, to this, this yacht sinking, right? You don't have time to sort of say, am I getting in the lifeboat or am I not getting in the lifeboat? Do I trust the lifeboat or don't I trust the life? Am I, am I going to be able to swim or can I swim or can't I swim? Well, it's way too late at that point in time. Okay. So when we have a spiritual battle, it's the same thing. Okay. If I hesitate to call on the Lord, if I hesitate or I question whether or not God can actually do it, that gives the enemy an in. It might be just a small little crack, but we don't even want to give him that. See, this is a battle, right? This is a warfare. And so you don't mess around with that. You know, when you follow battles and you follow the natural sort of thing, I mean, they're fighting, you know, a meter, a foot, a, you know, little pieces at a time, for a victory, right? And so, you know, they're not talking about, you know, we gained necessarily in a day, you know, 100 miles or, or whatever, or kilometers, right? They're talking about small incremental steps in the battle. And so if we leave a crack, that's a, that could be enough to cause, you know, unnecessary pain and unnecessary trial. So this idea of being so sure and fully trusting in the Lord, I need God's help with that. I do. Okay. And so we need to pray, Lord, increase my faith. And how much does the Bible say we need? Not lots. Not a lot. Right? Which really makes me think, okay, if the Bible says that all I really need is faith like the grain of a mustard seed, and if I'm 
sort of questioning a little bit. That means I don't even have that much. And that's really a shame to, to, to sort of say, right? But that's, again, it points me in the place, puts me in the place where I recognize how much I really need the Lord, right? How much I really need Him. And so when he says, surely He will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, from the noisome pestilence. Now, snares and this noisome pestilence, or a disease, okay? And noisome... Um, it means a couple different things. It doesn't mean noisy in the sense that we like. You might look at that word. It actually means something that is um, has a really disgusting, terrible odor. Is is the uh, the actual terminology that goes from that? Um, you know, or something that is deadly. Um, and so pestilence meaning disease. And, and what struck me here is that snares and diseases are, tend to be silent. Like, like a disease doesn't necessarily announce, here I come, you know, before it enters into your body, before it strikes your system. Right? I can't see it. I might see it in other people around me, but I can't actually physically see the virus or whatever it happens to be. Um, you know, so, and a snare is the same thing. It's hidden. Okay? And so, again, this idea, God sees it. If God is able to deliver us from these things, then obviously God can see it. All right? And so I have to trust in Him. When the Lord says something's coming, when the Lord says, don't go there, or He says, do this instead, there's a reason. And if I trust Him, then I'll do what he tells me to do. If I'm not sure, I'll hesitate. And if I don't trust him, I'll go my own way. But so we have to look at this. And, and the other piece, as we read on a little bit further here, this is the part, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't like. Because all of these words and, and what we see strongly suggested here, even just with the word deliverance, okay, and we've spoken on that before, but let me just remind you. To be delivered means to be brought out of or to have something removed from us. Okay? All right? So delivered from. And that means that something has already potentially afflicted me. Okay? And what we will see here, right? So when he speaks about, right, he will deliver thee from the snare. So I've already put my foot in it. And, and so God doesn't give up on us. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't look at me and say, oh, well, you've been trapped too bad. See you later. No. If I call on him, if I wait on him, all right, if I am dwelling in his presence, and then here some again would say, well, why would the Lord allow us to step into the snares? Why would the Lord allow us to get sick if he cares for us, if he loves us, if he's our refuge? And the only answer I have for you is there because he constantly needs to remind me how much I need him. Okay? I need to practice calling on the Lord because when I don't, I become proud in the flesh. I become proud in myself. And that's a recipe for disaster. And so God reminds us. Right? And where, you know, it says, if I just jump down for a second to verse 7, where it says, A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. When it says that, what we have to recognize is, is that God ultimately will keep us from the destruction that comes about from those snares and from the pestilences and all of those things. Okay? So our ending is not the same as that of those that don't believe. That those that don't, um, you know, that don't have the Lord as a shelter, right? Because, I'm going to go back now to verse 4, 
He shall cover thee with his feathers. Under his wings shalt thou trust. There it is again. Okay, that idea of trusting. Um, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Okay? So the psalmist is trying to cover basically all the bases, but the big point is we don't have to be afraid. And again, for that, I need God's help. Okay? Because sometimes we can spend a lot more time looking at this problem, that problem, this destruction, oh look at this, this is terrible, oh my, what are we going to do? And you can go in a big circle and then start all the way all over again, and you spend all of your time doing that instead of recognizing, wait a minute, what does the Bible say? That I do not need to be afraid. Why? If I'm dwelling with the Lord, if I have His presence, okay, in me, then I can trust in Him, right? And here again, using this idea of a shield and a buckler, um, the difference being, right, and again, we've looked at this before, but a shield was something large, okay? Um, and so traditionally, like, today we think of a shield, and I could show you something this big, you know, and, and I'm holding it with one arm, etc. That's a buckler, okay? A buckler was a personal smaller shield, often that was, you know, on the forearm that I could, in the same way I could use something else, a weapon, a sword, and the buckler, I could swing it around. Shield, by definition, is something larger, covers the entire body, okay? Would be used, you know, if you look historically, they would um, join their shields together to create like a wall, okay? because the shield went from the ground all the way up to higher to them, all right? And then they could insert their spears and things, you know, between them or over them, etc. So shields were, as I was praying about this, is really talking, I think, more about group protection. And then the buckler is that personal protection. And this is, again, this wonderful thing about the Lord, because he cares for the entire body, but he also cares for the individual members of the body. Okay? So I can have my own personal buckler, the Lord, okay? but as a congregation, as a kingdom, we have also his shield. Right? And so all of these things that we trust in, I better trust in the shield. Right? You get the picture, right? If I'm going to stand behind something, or in modern day terms, you know, if you tell me, put on this bulletproof vest, don't worry, nothing's going to penetrate. And then somebody stands, you know, 10 feet or 20 feet in front of me and fires, you know, and I'm just going to stand there because why? I'm trusting, <laughs> maybe not wisely, but I'm trusting Right? In this thing that you've put on me, and you say nothing's going to get through. It's the same idea here. Okay? But this is not going to fail. All right? And then he says in verse 8, Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. So we'll see it, and I suppose you could use some of these verses here for those that think you know, we're all going to be swept away before there's any turmoil or anything of that nature. Right? But here it says, we'll see. Right? Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. And the reward of the wicked is terrible. It's destruction. And the psalmist says, you will see it with your eyes. Okay? And he says, because if thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. So now we have one person encouraging another, okay? There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, okay? So, there is a two sides to this coin in a sense, okay? 
there is this piece where the psalmist says that if you fall into the pit, if you are trapped in the snare, God can deliver you. Praise the Lord for that. That's amazing. There is also this blessing that we see where now we've read a number of places where it says it won't come nigh you. So there is this recognition as well. And this is again all dependent on you and on me. Okay? And, and, and I'm not saying what you do should have an impact on me. So I'm going to say, take that back a little bit. It all depends on me. How am I doing with my dwelling with the Lord? Coming back to it again. This is the key. How am I doing with abiding in His presence? Okay? Because if I'm playing, you know, I'm out the door, I'm in the door. I'm out the door, I'm in the door. You know? You know how kids do that? You, know, you probably played that game. You know? Oh, you can't see me. And then they stick their head out. And then they go back in again, right? All right, and what are they doing? Uh, they're you know just waiting, getting ready to get smacked, all right, or something like that nature, right? If we're abiding with the Lord that way, well, you know, again, what do you expect? Right? Because the Bible tells me the devil's just waiting. He's just waiting. He's very patient. So those are the times when, you know, we, we mess up. And then, praise the Lord, if we call on Him, God will deliver. But if we stay in the shelter, these things need not befall us, okay? Because the, the Bible tells me here that will happen. And again, verse 9, linking back to verse 1, and see where it says, Because thou hast made the Lord, I've written in the column in my Bible, if... And, and those things are linked together, for me at least, right? Because if thou hast made, the, hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. Okay. So again, a reminder here that just because I'm saved doesn't mean that my kids are automatically saved. Or my mom is automatically saved. Or because my dad was saved and serving the Lord doesn't mean that that's a, something that I get just as a freebie. Right? I also have to make the Lord my habitation. Okay? And then he says, There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, if that thy dwelling is the habitation where the Lord is present. Okay? And it doesn't matter what the dwelling looks like on the outside. It doesn't matter what the dwelling, what the label is that you hang over the door, okay? So I can make a dwelling look amazing, and structurally, it can be garbage. Interior can be rotten, okay? All of the things that are necessary to make it function can be broken. I was thinking about that, again, you know, I've mentioned the fire panel being replaced tomorrow. Right? It's one of those things, and have you ever found this, even in your own home? Right? Some of these things that nobody really sees, and that you know, they don't make your house necessarily look prettier, and they don't, or any of those kind of things. When people come into your house, you know, they probably don't crawl underneath the sink and say, Oh, look at this beautiful plumbing you know, that's functioning here, or anything like that. Right? They, don't, they don't do that, yet those things are critical. And so the fire panel is the same sort of thing. So a lot of money to get it fixed. And most of us probably walk past it every time we're in church. You know, you don't give it even a thought. You might have wondered, oh, what's this? Now that it's beeping more often, you might pay a little more attention to it, right? You know, and after they fix it, we'll all forget about it again for a while. Hopefully, I'm looking forward to the beeping stopping, right? But the point is the same here. If our dwelling isn't truly the habitation of the Lord, then, quite frankly, what it looks like on the outside and what it calls itself means nothing 
That's again the form denying the power. Okay? And so you have to, and that emphasis is here again. Verse 11, for he shall, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And that's a wonderful promise. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. And hitting your foot against the stone hurts. And I suppose, as Pastor John could testify, can throw you for a loop and you can go flying. Okay, so it can be damaging, but in a sense, there are also far other things that could happen. And here the picture is basically that, you know, God's angels will protect all of you from the smallest thing to the largest thing. And again, it's a blessing, it's a promise that, that you know, uh, that we can receive. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Okay, so again, you have this, the power, and not because of us, but because of the Lord who is there. Okay, now going from verse 14, I've put in my uh, Bible here, God says, because now it says, because he hath set his love upon me, and the me that is there is the Lord. Okay, so now God is saying, because you, because I, this is what he wants, because we have set our love upon him. What does that mean? He's first. Okay, he's the priority. And because he is the priority and we are um, making our life show that, okay, therefore will I, that's the Lord again speaking, deliver him. Okay? I will set him on high because he hath known my name. And this idea of knowing God's name, again, this is not just so that you can say Jesus. It's so that you actually have experienced who Jesus is. Knowing his name is dwelling with him, abiding with him, spending time with him with him, and he with us. Okay. Then you know his name. All right? And so because you know, we know his name, that's when the Lord says, I will set him on high. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. So there's again this whole importance. Right? We have to call. You have to call. It's kind of like, um, so I'm, I'm someplace in a, in a storm, a natural storm. I don't say, bring the refuge to me. I don't say, bring the fortress to me where I am. I need to run to the fortress. I need to go to the refuge. All right? I need to call on the Lord. And, and so this attitude, which I think can be detrimental, where people sort of say, well, the Lord knows where I am. And the Lord knows what I'm going through. It, you know, they're saying that not so much as a factual sort of statement, because it is true. God knows exactly where you are. And he knows exactly what you're going through. There's no question about that. But, you know, when you say it the way I just finished saying it, you know, it, well, it's putting the onus back on the Lord and saying, I don't need to do anything. I don't need to pray. God sees my heart. I don't need to go to the altar. He knows what I need. He can meet me here. Like they take the truths in the scripture and twist them just a little bit. Okay? So that now it puts the responsibility back on the Lord to do things rather us doing things. Okay? And it's not that my doing is my gaining, you know, earning my way into heaven. My doing is showing my trust and my faith and my love for the Lord. Okay? And so when he says, he shall call upon me and I will answer him, the other thing that, that really highlights is, again, 
You call upon those that you believe you can trust. You call upon those that you believe will do something. Okay? Problem in many countries today. They don't call the police. Right? And then you say, why didn't you call the police? And the answer is, well, they're not going to do anything anyway. Or they're just as bad as the criminal. Right? And so when you have that sort of attitude, so now if I'm not calling on the police and I'm in trouble, who am I going to call on? And it generally becomes yourself is part of that answer. Right? So again, you see, when we don't call on the Lord, you're still going to call on something or someone whether that's a little medicine cabinet, or you're calling on the doctor, or you're calling on whatever, okay? But you're calling on someone or something when the calling needs to be primarily, number one, on the Lord. Because you know that's going to work. You know He will not fail you. He shall call upon me, and I will answer Him. And I, you know, again, and to me this is so critical, right? Because this says to me, when I look at the order, I call, God answers. Okay? The answer isn't going to come unless I call, is the way I look at this. Okay? So therefore, I have to acknowledge, I need help, I need refuge, I need, I need, I need, okay? And I call on Him. And then God will answer. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And then it says, With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Okay. So, in the end, as you look at this psalm, overall, I see only good stuff, only blessings, only wonderful things happening when I abide with the Lord. I don't see anything that is negative in any way, shape, or form. I don't see that I'm going to be missing out on the thrills of life. Or, you know, some people, well, if I'm a Christian, I can't do this, and I can't do this, and I can't do this, and I can't do this. Well, stop for a second. What are all these things that you're saying you can't do, you can't do, you can't do, you can't... Are these good things? No, they're not. They're evil things. They're all things that might, you know, have this outward shell of wonder and they might look amazing and they might taste really good and all of those things, but it's poison. That the world that Satan has convinced people, they need to do these things. Oh, we need to have this. We need to have this. And no, you don't. No, you don't. I've spoken before. You know, Steph and I watch these home renovation shows. Watched one yesterday. Right? Well, you can do this in the house and fix this kitchen and fix this and fix that and fix this. But the thing we really need, we need a bar. <laughs> Above everything else, we need a bar. Right? You know. You know. No, you don't. Who says you need a bar? The devil says you need a bar. The devil says you need alcohol. The devil says you need these sinful pleasures. Okay? So, again, now who are you going to trust? Who are you going to believe? It's a simple sort of statement. I get it. But it really comes down to that. Okay? Do you really need that bottle to enjoy life? What's in it? Do you really need that drug? Do you really need that sexual pleasure? Do you really need those things? Or is Satan just selling you a whole bunch of garbage and a whole bunch of lies? And he's good at it. Don't get me wrong. He's good at it. And again, if you give him a crack, give him a little opening, he'll flood your brain and your mind. And all of a sudden, all these people will be coming your way that seem to be promoting exactly now what your body is craving, what your mind is seeking. Why? Because you're not dwelling with the Lord. You're not abiding in His presence. His shelter, you're not 
under and behind the shield anymore. Okay? You took your head and you stuck it out. And right away the enemy targeted you. Okay? And what were you trying to prove when you did that? That you were a tough guy? That you were so strong? That you don't need the Lord? All wrong attitude. Okay? And so we have to be thankful for the guardrails the Lord puts up, the boundaries the scripture provides for us. Because as I said, when we dwell and we abide, okay, and our habitation, and you look at all these words, when my fortress and my refuge, all of these things are the Lord, then all I see is victory, success, joy, peace, all of the blessings that the Lord can provide for us. They're all there. We just have to be wise enough and desire to recognize that we need him every step of the way. But I'm going to close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your spirit and your goodness. And Father, I thank you for your promises. You know, these aren't just words that were written and that have no meaning, have no foundation. But Lord, your word is true. And help me, dear Lord God, to not only say that, but recognize it, feel it, and know, dear Lord Jesus, that you abide here and I am abiding with you. Lord, there's so much danger out there. And Satan has, has clothed all of the danger. He is that wolf in sheep's clothing. Looks so good, sounds so wonderful. And yet there's death and destruction right there. Father, we need your help to open our eyes, to give us ears to hear, but most importantly, that we would stay where you tell us to stay, where you have provided for us a place of refuge, a place of peace, that even in the storm, and yes, that New Testament example is so powerful, with Christ in the vessel, with Christ in the vessel, we smile at the storm. Thank you, Lord, for this day. And I pray, dear Lord Jesus, continue now. Take us, dear Lord, into service. Help us, dear Lord, to open our mouths in worship and to let go and let your spirit have its way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Praise the Lord.